They told me I didn't need an introduction, so. <laughs>
She sat down and soon another woman followed. This time a younger woman who had been able to travel to New York where abortion was legal even before Roe. So she had had her pregnancy terminated in a bona fide clinic. She did, however, still remember the four hour ride home in a dark Greyhound bus with a filthy restroom where she spent most of the ride trying to control her bleeding. Her boyfriend picked her up at the bus station. She had had, he had had final exams that day. She passed out in his car. Despite all this, she was grateful she hadn't had to, quote, use a coat hanger instead. And so it went, story after story, until we were all spent. I heard from women I had known all my life and whose abortions I never knew had taken place. There were tales from elderly women, young mothers, teenagers, and even a few stories from the men who loved them. It was an unforgettable night that spoke to an undeniable truth. Women had been set free by Roe in the most basic, intimate way. That national decision gave us back more than reproductive freedom. It restored our dignity, our security, our safety, and our privacy. Now, more than two decades since those brave souls came forward to remind us of things we must never forget, and now it's 40 years since this was written 20 years ago. This nation still needs to have the serious discussion on the abortion issue it has always avoided. One based on facts, not on sheer emotions or any singular religious perspective. If there is, in fact, a right to life, Who's the, those women and these women and men today will be speaking courageously that night and now about how they will exercise theirs. America now faces the possibility that nightmares such as were described in that speak out more than 40 years ago may be returning to another grim replay. Some of us are determined to ensure that that will never, ever happen. Some of us also understand that Roe may not be the final answer and we must gear up for new legislation, legislative initiatives that will guarantee reproductive freedom beyond Roe. The reason that the stories of women are so powerful, actually, you will appreciate this, our poet. I actually said in an email to the committee, in the last couple of days. You also have to understand that these stories that are going to be told are poetry. Because they are the most powerful arm in our arsenal. You will see people moved by these stories, legislators, governors, I'm not going to say president because I don't even want to say that word and he's immovable and stupid. But someday a president, or the previous president, and a president that hopefully if we live long enough we'll have again, will be moved by these stories. They're powerful. So we must always listen to them and give the women time and space to tell them. So as an example of how people are moved, wherever they are on the spectrum that we just talked about, in terms of who's for and against, they're in the middle and on the fence and whatever. During the time of the ad when we were collecting signatures, I received a letter from a wonderful nurse who was a colleague of mine when I worked at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Actually, it was so long ago that it was Peter Ben Brigham then in Boston. And this is not a woman who is a pro-choice person. This is a woman who raised two children by herself. She's a survivor of sexual abuse by her father. Her sister was a similar victim, and she told her mother, never leave my daughter alone with him, and the mother did, and so her daughter was also. She has serious water to carry. With all of that, she wrote to me, now from, she doesn't live in Rhode Island any longer, but from far away, because she knew about the air. 
It is important, as you have mentioned in one of your blogs, that one's personal beliefs are not the issue here. The primary focus needs to be on the health and well-being of women in Rhode Island and elsewhere. All women deserve safe care. I did not personally choose abortion, but have always felt I could not impose my beliefs on my patients. My goal was to give my patients safe and supportive resources for whatever avenue they choose when faced with an unwanted pregnancy. This philosophy was underscored by many experiences. One in particular was a case of a young woman who used a coat hanger to abort her fetus because safe resources were not available. One never forgets holding a 21-year-old woman's hand on the way to the operating room where she died. So that's the power. And to comfort ourselves with the knowledge that it never dies, I'm always happy when a young woman, especially a young famous woman who can have a following and make a dent, says something important along these lines. And strangely enough, in of all places, Vanity Fair magazine, not exactly a place you go for wisdom. <laughs> Recently, there was a cover article about Michelle Williams, who is a great actress and whom I admire. She was writing about the power of women now. And this paragraph struck me, and I had saved it in my drawer the other day. Again, God was talking to me. I went to look for something to write my remarks, and this little piece of paper came flying out of some place. And, and so I said, he wants me to talk about this, or she does. Women have to be watchdogs for each other. A great change has come. But if it's, it's not just for me and those in my industry. That would not be enough. Women must recognize what power we have and where, however small and dull it might feel, we must use it to advocate on behalf of others for the betterment of all of us and of those who will follow us. So that's what I leave you with. Um, I will just quote one more great woman. Her name was March Tewitt. She was a sister of mercy. They're all great. And they're all pro choice, by the way. Um, and I met March Tewitt when I was invited by her after the excommunication to speak in Chicago, where she was. And she said, Come on, we're going to go speak right on the steps of the cathedral. Not that she was bathing anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we go down to the cathedral steps in Chicago. And I spoke, and March spoke, and all of a sudden, the biggest flatbed truck I ever saw, the size of this aisle and wider, drove up, filled with men, carrying galvanized garbage, <laughs> garbage cans, filled with rubber dolls painted to look like bloody fetuses, who hang me in effigy. And March said to her colleagues who were there, get ready, because when they come after one of us, they're coming after all of us. And it's always been my battle cry. This is a war. And I met the people from the Woman Project after I went to speak in the legislature in April on the House side. I hadn't spoken in the State House since 1987 when I left Planned Parenthood. It wasn't my job. I didn't think it was right for me to do it. But I was moved to go. I had been invited to participate, so I went. And as, frankly, only I can, I left them with something to remember. And you can see it. It's on the Woman Project website, the, the video of this. And later, so many of the young women who spoke to me afterwards, they were happy. They thought, oh, good, this is great. She made this speech, and they loved it, and now something will happen. And I said, this, this is not, nothing's happening. This is like a memory for them. They will remember it, and it makes a dent somewhere. And they say, geez, we hope she doesn't come back again. <laughs> but it's not going to pass the bill. The bill is still going to be buried. They will only listen to us if we can frighten them. They need to be frightened. And how do you frighten them? Money and votes. Nothing else matters. 
So don't waste your time on being nice to them and going to their times with the chicken and that room. That's not what does it. They have to fear you. That's what the ad says with 1,157 people that they can recognize who may give them money or not give them money. And when we say in the ad, we're not voting for you if you don't do this. That's the kind of thing that matters. So I don't just, I, I don't have enough years to waste my time being nice to you. And neither do you. So thank you to the Women Project for putting this together and for all they've done. And thank you for being here. And I look forward to hearing the story because the stories are the next.